Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Thanks for joining us today. Back pain is an incredibly common problem. Most of us will experience it at some time during our lifetimes, but for some people it can be a very debilitating problem. Fortunately, there are many potential therapies to consider. Here to discuss with us today is one of my favorite experts, co-workers, and my husband, Dr. Tim Lamer. Tim is an anesthesiologist, pain medicine specialist, and spine specialist at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being here, Tim. Thank you, Dr. Gazelka. Helena, uh, this You're is indeed a pleasure. My pleasure to be here and interviewed by you. Thank you. I'm excited to share some of the work that's going on in spine and back pain medicine today. So would you start us out, Tim, by telling us a little bit about what the range of therapies for back pain would include when a patient came to see a, a spine specialist such as yourself? It begins with you know, something as simple as an acetaminophen all the way up to you know, major surgical procedures. I think maybe the, the easiest way to look at it is kind of categorized back pain between acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain is the pain that almost everybody's gonna get at some point in their life. You know, maybe you did too much gardening, you know, a long car ride, too much work around the house, something like that. And you're, you know, you get a backache or you get some back pain. May linger for some days, may linger for a few weeks. Um, we all experience that. The good news about that is that pain usually goes away, almost always goes away. So really it's just a matter of, you know, finding some things to get you by for that, you know, period of time. Might be over the counter analgesics, home remedies such as heat or ice, uh, maybe see the chiropractor, things like that to get you through it. More problematic is chronic pain. That's the kind of stuff that brings patients to see me either in the spine center or the pain management clinic. Uh, chronic pain is that pain that just doesn't go away. You know, you've tried all your home remedies. You've tried over-the-counter things. Maybe you've seen your family doc a few times, but the pain just lingers and persists. Again, fortunately, we do have a nice range of, of treatments, again, ranging from conservative to more aggressive. Typically, things like uh, prescription strength medica medications. Where we're not really talking about opioids. We rarely have to resort to opioids, but there are other non-opioid prescription uh, pain medications. Exercise. Physical therapy is almost always part of the treatment plan. No matter what else we do, um, we need to teach patients to move and to be able to you know, get around with their, with their pain. So that's going to be important. We may consider uh, injections. If, if we think that the patient has, for example, an inflamed joint or some inflammation going on, we may think about a cortisone or a steroid type injection. There are nerve blocks. We can use nerve blocks um, to help deaden the pain, to help blunt the pain. And oftentimes this can be very useful to help the patients get on their PT program, on their exercise program. We use integrative techniques, acupuncture, massage. Uh, again, chiropractic therapy can come into play. Osteopathic manipulation, things like education. You know, by the time patients come to see us, they've had pain for quite a while. Oftentimes they don't, really don't even know what's going on. And just, you know, giving them some information about what's going on, um, things we can do to treat it can be very helpful. Information is, is very powerful. Tim, you mentioned the difference between acute back pain, which is just kind of happened and we expect it to go away, versus chronic pain where people are suffering from this for much of their lives at times. Obviously, we see many more patients in that chronic category and many of them have already had back surgery by the time we see them. Do you treat patients who have had back surgery differently than you treat patients who haven't had back surgery? First thing is back surgery introduces a whole new set of variables. So in addition to things that any of us can have when we haven't had surgery, such as muscular pain, joint pain, disc pain, just the surgical procedure itself introduces a whole new set of variables and things that could have happened that could be contributing to the patient's pain and things that we have to assess for. When we do surgery, we're cutting through tissue. Muscles can be damaged. They can be atrophied. Nerves can be damaged. Nerves can be injured. So you can have persistent muscle pain. You can have persistent nerve pain after surgery. Um, scar tissue. Scar tissue can be a source of pain in some people. So these are all the additional things that we have to look at when we see a patient who's had surgery. What is a spinal cord stimulator and how does it work? A spinal cord stimulator, it's a, it's a gadget. It's a medical device. What it is or what it does is it delivers an electrical current or a set of electrical currents to the spinal cord with the net effect of trying to block the patient's pain. So it's a device where there's a wire that's placed next to the spinal cord. It's hooked up to a battery. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. 
and it delivers an electrical current to the spinal cord and that electrical current blocks or basically intercepts the pain signal so that the patient experiences less pain. It's kind of an electrical pain numbing or pain blocking device. Having a device in the spine sounds a bit invasive. And um, as you know, many of our patients, even those who have undergone back surgery in the past are very leery about having something left in my back. Can you tell us a little about the process to and the procedure to implant a spinal cord stimulator and is it risky? The procedure is minimally invasive. And so that's the good news. But sometimes that minimally invasive nature also makes it a little deceptive in a sense. So what we do is we place a series of wires and they're, they're tiny little wires, um, you know, a little bit bigger than a, than a fishing line. They're inserted into the spine in a minimally invasive surgical procedure. And then we take a small battery or generator. I tell people, you know, think of the size of an Oreo cookie, not even double stuffed anymore, just an Oreo cookie. That's about the size of most of the generators and that, that's placed underneath the skin. The generator is connected to the wires. We program that generator to get the right electrical parameters, and then those uh, electrical parameters are de delivered to the spinal cord, and they intercept or block the pain signal. I said it's minimally, minimally invasive, and it is. It's an outpatient procedure, believe it or not. You heard that I'm, I'm putting this device right next to your spinal cord, okay? So there, there are some risks. Luckily, you know, we understand the anatomy. We get all the appropriate imaging before we put the device in, and in skilled hands, the serious complication rate is actually very low. There are some nuisance things that can happen uh, that are more problematic. Sometimes the wires slip out of place. Sometimes they move a little bit. We have to kind of go back and insert them. The more problematic ones are really some of the nuisance types of, uh, of things. The serious complications that you might think about when we're dealing with the spinal cord, such as a nerve injury or spine injury or even paralysis, are fortunately uh, exceedingly rare when the procedure is done in skilled hands. We were just talking about patients who've had back surgery, before we started talking about spinal uh, cord stimulators, are they intertwined? In other words, do you have to have had a back surgery in the past to be eligible or to be able to have a spinal cord stimulator? When this device was originally essentially in invented and developed, it was developed for that patient population, patients who've had previous back surgery and either didn't get better or had recurrent pain. Over time, we've realized that this device can be very powerful for many other pain problems as well. And so while it is true that we still use this device most commonly for people who had previous spine surgery, and again, either didn't get the results they wanted or maybe had recurrent pain, that's the most common scenario. But now there are many, many other scenarios that we use it for. As a broad category, it can be very effective for patients who have chronic nerve pain or nerve-related pain any type of nerve injury after trauma. So somebody's had a car accident, someone's had a work-related accident, and they've injured a nerve in their arm or injured a nerve in their leg, and they have you know, a difficulty with pain. These devices can be extremely helpful in that setting. And that's probably the second most common scenario that we use this for. Another common type of nerve pain, uh, neuropathies. What's a neuropathy? Uh, neuropathy is basically a, a pain Painful neuropathy is a pain that's coming from an injured or poorly functioning nerve. Uh, the most common example that we use it for are patients who have what we call diabetic neuropathy. So patients with diabetes can get uh, painful nerve dysfunction. That can be quite debilitating. Um, and these devices can be very helpful in that setting. There are a host of other nerve-related pain problems that we use these for, and they can be very effective for that. But these are some of the most common things that we see. I just thought of two more we might mention, things like post neuralgia, so patients who've had shingles and have pain afterward, or patients who've had a thoracotomy or some kind of surgery where they're left with nerve pain that persists for a long time. You know, if you, if you brought those cases up to me 20 years ago, I would say, you know, I, the likelihood that we're going to be able to help that is not very high. But fortunately, like any device, like any gadget, and like electronics in general, these devices have really advanced, in, and especially in the past 10 years, with some really uh, neat technology that allows us to help some of these really, uh, what were previously very, very difficult to manage pain problems. Tim, how can a patient know if they might be a candidate for a spinal cord stimulator or if a spinal cord stimulator might be helpful for the type of pain they suffer from? The first clue is that you have pain and it's not getting better. 
that's why patients come to see us, right? Probably seeing your family doctor, your, your general practitioner, primary care practitioner. They've tried some of the things that, that they have in their tool bag, like prescription medications, for example. Maybe you've tried some physical therapy, but just not turning the corner. Uh, and pain is really kind of kind of keeping you down. Now, I wouldn't advocate putting this in, for example, if your pain was like a two or a three, but if you've got really debilitating pain, you know, that's really inhibiting your function or making it difficult to get by day to day, that's when we start looking at, at this device. So you've, you've got a pain problem, you've made a good effort at trying conservative measures with medications, with exercise, with physical therapy, things like that, and just not turning the corner, then you might be a candidate for this device. You know, the thing to do in that setting is to uh, get a referral to a qualified interventional pain management specialist who uh, deals with sp spinal cord stimulators. How do you know if you're finding a good pain physician or not? That's a million dollar question whether you're trying to find a cardiologist or a back surgeon or, or a pain specialist or whatever. But here's the things that I tell my patients to look at. So if I see a patient here and they're going back home, say, to Illinois or to Florida or whatever, they often ask me that question. Now, sometimes we, we can get them to the right person, but, but in general, these are the things to look for. Number one, board certification. That's an absolute. Now, that doesn't mean they're good. That doesn't mean they're competent, but that's the bare minimum. If somebody's not board certified, that should be red flags, okay? So that's the minimum. So they should have a board certification. You can go to the American Board of Medical Specialties website, abms.org, and you can look up and see if your doc is board certified. The next thing, uh, and this is a good differentiator, is fellowship training. In our field, in pain management, there are not a lot of pain management fellowships. So if your pain doc has been fellowship trained, chances are they're pretty doggone good docs because they had to um, you know, go through a pretty significant process to get trained, uh, to get competently trained. Now, I wouldn't say not having fellowship training is a deal killer. There should be a conversation about why. You know, so what, why aren't you fellowship trained? What are the circumstances that led you to not be fellowship trained? And why are you qualified to be a pain management specialist? And, and I know some, some really good pain docs who have not been fellowship trained. Uh, but again, that's a differentiator. You can, you know, if your doc's been fellowship trained, that's a really good sign. Experience. Not only can you, but you should ask. You know, if you have somebody that's going to be doing surgical procedures, invasive procedures, not only can you ask, but you should, you know, what's your experience? You know, what are your outcomes? What have you done? How many have you done? Those are legit questions um, that you should ask your doc. And then one more thing that I think people forget about is, uh, is hospital privileges. Um, remember, when you're seeing your pain management physician, you're probably seeing them in an outpatient office, probably not in a hospital. But you should ask them if they have hospital privileges. Now, again, not having hospital privileges is not a deal killer but you should ask why. Maybe a yellow flag should, should go up. Why are hospital privileges helpful? Because if your doc has hospital privileges at a good hospital, that hospital's already done some of the legwork for you. They've already checked for board certification. They've already checked that that doc has experience doing the procedures that that doc says that person can do. They've done a background check. They've checked for malpractice. They've checked for other disciplinary measures. So they've done a lot of the legwork that you might be interested in. So, you know, having hospital privileges at a good hospital um, is, is helpful. Tim, can you briefly walk us through the process uh, that we go through at Mayo Clinic to decide if someone might be a candidate for a spinal cord stimulator and to finally get to the point of implanting one? Yes, yeah, so let's just use a hypothetical example. A patient comes in, um, maybe they've had a spine operation, did better for, for a while, maybe for a year or so, and then their pain came back. They went back to see their surgeon, and the surgeon said, well, I, I don't think I can help you or I can offer you another surgery, but I can only give you a 30 or 40% chance of improvement. That's a very common scenario. Again, maybe they've tried some medications, maybe they've tried some other treatments, but now they're you know, a year, two years, three years into things and they're just not getting better. So that's number one. They have failed extensive treatment and yet they continue to be significantly debilitated. Obviously, the first thing we do is just check and make sure that they've tried reasonable conservative options. You know, nobody uh, would, would say that spinal cord stimulation is a first-line therapy. Uh, we want to make sure that they've had at least a, a, a trial of conservative things. Next thing is anatomy. They have to have, we, obviously, we image their spine, usually with x-rays and an MRI, to make sure that the anatomy is okay 
to insert the devices. So they'll we'll get imaging, obviously do a history and exam, uh, check their you know, check their neurologic status, check their musculoskeletal status. Next thing we do is look at their functional level. You know what what can they and can't they do? And then a very important part of the process is outlining therapeutic goals. I know what I what I think the patient should be able to do afterwards, but that's not very important. What's really important is what does the patient want afterwards? What are they looking for? I mean, obviously they're looking for pain relief, but we look for functional goals. What kind of functional improvements do you want to have? What do you want to be able to do? What do you want this device to be able to help you to do? Um, Those are really important questions and we spend a lot of time on that. We usually require, and in fact, most insurance companies require basically a psychological screening evaluation. And what we're looking for, there are a few basic things. Number one, people who have chronic medical problems, whether it's pain or diabetes or whatever, chronic medical problems are associated with a high, basically a high frequency of depression or underlying mood disorders. And so we look for that. We want to make sure that if there is one, that that's being attended to and being treated properly. So we screen for that. We're also screening for uh, substance use disorders. Um, Stimulators or or any interventional treatment has a high failure rate if there's an underlying untreated uh, substance disorder, so that we look for that. And then we look at other medical comorbidities that might affect the device. So this is gonna be a surgical procedure. We have to look at their healing properties, their immune status, whether they're on blood thinners, you know, a good medical history. Uh, Those are kind of the key things that we look at. Tim, would you briefly tell us the difference between having a trial and having an implant? With many surgical procedures, it's kind of a, you know, you have the surgery and then, you know, you're done and whatever happens, happens. But with the stimulator, we actually uh, divide this up. Uh, It's a two-part process. Okay, so there's part one and part two. Part one is a trial. It's basically a test run. So we can actually insert those little wires that we talked about without actually doing an operation. We can place under local anesthetic, usually with some light sedation. We can place some small needles in the back. We can feed the wires through the needles, take the needles out, put a big bandage over the patient's back, and then the patient goes home for a week. So basically you have a couple wires they're, you know, they're coming out of your back. They're underneath a big bandage. We hook those wires up to a temporary generator, a temporary battery, and we have the patient go through as much as they can with a big bandage on their back, their normal daily activities. We have them record their pain. We have them record their functional level. And yet, at the end of that approximately one week trial period, we have them come back to the office. We take the wires out. And again, there's no incisions. So the wires just slide out much like an IV would come out. And then we have a discussion with the patient on how they did, how they did pain-wise. You know, actually in reality, we're discussing with the patient each day. But at the end of that trial period, we decide with the patient's input, you know, if if they're a candidate to actually have the surgical implant. You know, we're obviously looking for, did the patient, was the patient able to achieve some of those goals that we talked about in terms of pain reduction, in terms of functional improvement? When I discuss this with patients, that's one of my favorite things to be able to tell them, that we actually are going to let them try it out before we do the permanent implant. Because I think there's, there are a few other things, interventions or surgeries that we do where you get to try it out first. Obviously, patients, you're sitting with the patient in your office, the patient's trying to decide, you know, do I really want to you know, go this invasive? You know, we get other questions like, do you think I should just, should I, should I take some opioids? Should I go on medical cannabis? Should I do this? Should I do that? So we can have this conversation about, hey, you know what? We can put this temporary device in. You can test it out. And at the end of a week, you know, you've got a real good chance to kind of make a, a good informed decision about whether this is the right therapy for you or not. Well, thanks so much for being here, Tim. It has been very enlightening and enjoyable to get to converse with you on Q&A today. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Lamer here with us today. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And I wish you a great day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.